Hey everyone, and welcome to the Binary Atlas podcast, where we discuss all things technology and as it relates to us. And today we are going to be discussing artificial intelligence and how that affects both our everyday lives and uh, art and different kinds of subject matter. Um, as always, my wife Brandy is here with me. Say hi, Brandy. Hello. <laughs> uh, so we're going to cover several things. We're going to cover Dolly 2. We're going to cover Chat GPT. We're going to cover uh, Bing's integration of Chat GPT. Uh, we're also going to cover Mid Journey, which is strictly an art focused AI. Uh, I guess we'll just start with, in general, what these artificial intelligences are, right? Uh, in respect to the Chat GPT world, those are what's called a learning language model. Okay, so they're basically trained on dumping the internet into them. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy here lately, especially with uh, Microsoft's investment in Chat GPT. They're not always right, uh, but they get close and they get kind of freaky sometimes in how they interact with you. But they are still just a language model that's trying to guess what you want them to say next. Uh, I've used it in my everyday work life as an IT guy, uh, looking up how to fix things, how to do code, how to do all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, it ranges from those kind of interactions over to giving prompts of show me an Australian shepherd standing on a log in the forest, and it'll draw you that. Sometimes the drawings are pretty good. Sometimes the drawings are pretty bad. Uh, and we're going to dive deeper into that. So let's dive into, I guess, chat GPT first. That sounds good. Uh, I know you have some experience in using it. We did a search for, because you, you work in the. I work, I work in, space. yes, I work in content marketing, uh, writing for SEO. And while I don't mind chat GPT or even the being, um, AI as an alternative to a search engine. Um, I don't necessarily agree with anybody trying to have chat GPT or the Bing AI write an article for them if they're passing it off as their own work. That's where it gets sticky. I know. And, and I've done this, right? So, and I'll just be totally open with everybody that's listening right now. So on binaryatlas.com, uh, I needed to get some more blog articles up there. And I had done some video reviews of different games, right? Older games, not like brand new, just, just launched games. And so instead of me trying to convert my audio to text, I asked ChatGPT, I says, ChatGPT, can you give me a review of a video, said video game with at least a thousand words, and it sped it out. Now, did I go through and edit some of it? I did, because some of it were things that said I didn't agree with. And then at the bottom of the article, I embedded my video, right? So for me, it was more of a not trying to write a novel and say I did something. Mine was trying to generate some content for a search engine to pick up on and have my video down at the bottom. Yes, and I can see how people are going to do that, but I think it's a slippery slope. Um, I know that when I looked up certain things regarding my job, um, the chat GPT and AI in Bing, they actually answered the question correctly. So that was helpful. And some of the things that maybe I have written for my job have shown up. So I feel like that's a really good use of it. Now, as far as, you know, somebody making content for their website or something like that, if it's a personal business, whatever they want to do, I feel like they should disclose that it was created by AI and edited by a human. Um, I just feel like anything other than that could be considered plagiarism because everything that has been fed to these chat GPT AI type situations is something that someone else has written. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's plagiarism. I think that, I mean, you, you also work <laughs> with high school students. I feel like there may be some high school students trying to use these programs as now, a way to the, get papers. On the positive side, if you suspect that you can actually paste in 
every that entire like say a student turns in a book review or whatever mm -hmm. right you can actually paste that in the chat gpt and say did you write this yes and it will say if it did or not so that's helpful so at least it can be checked and there's a lot of checks for plagiarism both on the collegiate level and the high school level it's just it's difficult i mean i realize we have to evolve with the times but as a writer myself um I just don't think that AI can generate anything quite at the level that a human could. No, and, that, and now, and we're in, we're in the infancy, right? True. So me being the technologist and love technology, I see where it could go. That's what's got me excited about it. But I also realize where it's at. I realize that if I go to Bing, this using chat GBT in the background, and I ask Bing, what is the three best vacuums on the market, right? I am going to double check that. I am personally not going to take it as fact, right? That makes sense. Letting Ross go in. Yes, our dog wants to take part in the technology. Okay, so. well, you come in here and you can be our unofficial mascot for this recording. Absolutely. But, you know, so, I mean... I have used it for really cool things. So like I said, I'm an IT guy in my daily life, right? And I had a situation come up where uh, we had a new computer come in that needed to be deployed and I needed to deploy Office 365. Now, usually for me, that involves getting on the computer, that involves going to a shared network drive and launching the installer on a command prompt with the proper XML config file for our organization and then it installs Office. It, it's fairly intense, right? It sounds like it. Cause you lost me at, I sometimes install <laughs> these, but you know, so I thought to myself, I'll ask Bing, how do I deploy office 365? And I did. And it gave me three options. And one of those options was PowerShell. That's a programming language that I'm familiar with. So I said, well, can you explain more how to do it in PowerShell? And it said, sure. Not only did it tell me how to do it, but it gave me the code that I can paste into a command prompt that installed Office 365 on a remote computer, and it worked. And that's wonderful. And see, the way I see that, you used it as a search engine. You could have found that information online. Correct. Searching for it. Was, it. It, was, it was a quicker way to find the information I needed, but it still could have been wrong. True. What worries, what worries me is with uh, a lot of these chat engines is the fact that people are going to there, are, you know what? I'm just going to say it. There are people out there who shouldn't be on the internet. Okay. There are people that when they see an article or a post on social media, they immediately believe that whatever is said is true. Lizard men are taking over downtown, right? Uh, they don't go try to get three different sources. They don't try to go see if it's actually factual or not. They, they start calling their friends and family. Oh, you won't believe what I just read. So here's a problem with these language learning models, the language learning models take everything they've read on the internet and try to respond with what they think you want, right? So if you ask them a conspiracy theory, they are going to take you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> that makes sense. But in the same sense, I mean, someone could find that information doing searches and come up with all of those those things. The same way when you're legitimately searching for something, you could... That's theoretically true. run across a website that's full of crap. Now you can, but here's, but here's the funny thing. That's me finding website after website, trying to find stuff. That's different than what I would consider an authority telling me something is true. Yes. Right. So that's why I think, and, and now being Microsoft and being, they have taken steps to kind of alleviate this. They have limited the number of responses you can ask. So basically you're given a session, uh, when you start chatting with it, it starts giving you responses. But after I think like maybe 10 responses, it cuts off your chat session and says, we need to start a new chat session. Okay. And that new chat session erases everything you said before. So Bing no longer knows what you're talking about. Like that's the other thing with these chat guys, right? It's like they clearing your search history. It's like clearing your search. So you start fresh and then you start your new query. So they're trying to make it safer. And the company that's behind this, OpenAI, they're the ones Microsoft invested in to get a, to get a hold of ChatGPT. They understand. I've I've had re, uh, listened to reviews, and I've also listened to uh, interviews with the CEO, and he realizes the limitations of it. 
But what he thinks is, is it's important for people to get used to it now with all its flaws so that you know how to use it when it doesn't have any. It'll help them find all the flaws and fix them is what he thinks. Well, that makes sense. I mean, it's, I guess, similar to how the Internet came to be. It wasn't always what it is today. I mean, you remember going on a mainframe mm-hmm. to check email. I do. And, and yeah, I remember that quite Yeah, well. I guess we're revealing our, our right. older <laughs> age, our older age to people. You know, I remember a time when I didn't have internet at home and anybody, you know, pretty young listening is probably horrified by that. But you know, but, here's the funny thing though. The internet is a great thing. It's also a very powerful thing. And I think it's been around for what, 20 years now, 30 uh, closer to, I mean, it depends on what we Dep- define uh, as it internet. It depends on what you define at the start of, right? So I define it that, you know, back in 1997, uh, when I graduated high school and went to college, that was my first experience touching the internet. So uh, you're talking to at least back then, probably a little earlier, right? And I still think mankind as a whole is still not very responsible with that power that it has. That's you, true. You know what I'm saying there? Yes. So it worries me that we still haven't, master the responsibility of the internet as it is now. And then it's fixing to change again. Well, I mean, is it masterable? I mean, I don't know. You would like to think so. I mean, I think about book knowledge, not everything in books is true. true. Um, So I feel like it, it's been, it's a mankind problem more than it's a technology problem when it comes to misinformation. Um, I'm fairly certain that there have been idiots around since the beginning of time. And some people are just naturally more gullible than others when it comes to, you know, for instance, believing that the lizard men are, <laughs> are running course, about downtown. Yes. Well, of course, our local high school team is the sand lizards. So theoretically, if a bunch of high school kids donned lizard, you know, lizard costumes and <laughs> ran around downtown, um, it's not so high outside the possibility. Now we'll talk. So um, I know one of the things that Brandy was really interested in is getting some t- into some of the art pieces of this. So uh, I'm going to, we're going to talk about Dolly two and mid journey, but first I want to throw out there an example that came up. Uh, so there was a gentleman who used artificial intelligence. He generated the art and he generated the story for a children's book. And he published it on Amazon for sale. And he got a huge bunch of blowback for it. Now, I'm going to say up front, there was no image in that book that looked like anything anybody else had drawn. There was no wording in that book that was copyrighted by anybody else. It was original for what he used the tool for, right? But he got a lot of blowback from artists and stuff like that. Uh, so that's one flip side of the coin, right? Mm-hmm. The other flip side of the coin that I, as I saw an artist talking about today, how artists are loving these tools because it helps them do prototyping of ideas. Yes. Right. Like instead of, you know, throwing their IDs on a canvas and throwing the canvas out and doing another one to try, you know, I'm not an artist per se, so I don't know that creative process, but some artists are liking this for the, uh, inspiration aspect of the yes. art. Well, and I can understand using it for inspiration, but someone throwing it out there as their own original work, not disclosing that they've used AI. That's, I, the, that's the buzzword right I, now. Should I, people disclose that they used it or not? I think they should. Um, this is not the same as, you know, you need to disclose what kind of paint you used or, you know, I used a you know, certain type of pencil when I drew my art or a certain type of scanner to scan it into the computer. Um, as an artist myself, I I would never try to pass something off as my own work if I didn't create it. Um, now, I mean, as an author and artist, I have used things from freepick.com. Um, those are things that you have to attribute. So you basically put that attribution on your copyright page where you got the images and you are allowed to alter those, but you still disclose that you got them from that 
particular artist. And I totally get where you're coming from on that. I really, really do. It's just that not being an artist, right? When I'm looking at it from the outside, trying to decide if I think people should disclose that or not, I keep running back to, like you said, it's not the same thing as an artist being forced to tell you what kind of paint they used. But on another level, it kind of is. So let's, there was, there, there, there was another transition that we haven't talked about where you transition, some, a lot of artists transition from a uh, canvas and a brush to an iPad or some other kind of digital surface where they did their artwork. Yes. Right? Are they using their hand and drawing okay, they are, it? They are. But then a lot of those tools in those apps help you draw a smoother line or help you draw a curved line or help you draw patterns and things. There's all kinds of different brushes and patterns and shapes that the software and that digital interface helps you do. Yet these artists are counting those as originals works of art and they are putting them up for sale. Some of Yes. Them. And that I can understand. You are technically using it as a tool in that context. You're directing it to do exactly what you want it to do, following along step by step. Okay. Whereas with this AI, you're giving a brief description and it's doing it for you based on everything that it's seen on the internet. Well, so we've done a couple of prompts on this. We've done it both on Dolly 2 and Mid Journey. And our prompts have been very brief, right? Because one, I don't really know how to use it all that well. This is my first experience using it. But I've seen prompts, paragraphs long for a prompt. And I watched a guy on YouTube today. He gave a prompt. And then he got four different variations on that prompt. And then he picked one of those variations. Then he asked for another variation on that one to get four more variations. And then he kept doing what was called a remix and adding prompts and taking away prompts and doing... It was more than just giving a simple uh, three words and it draws an art masterpiece. He was really dialing in what he wanted the AI to do, right? So when he's doing that, that is akin for me of an artist on that iPad or digital touch surface clicking several different things and drawing a line. And then if that line's not right, clicking a couple of things and doing another filter on that line, the artist is inputting digital commands and getting an, a result. That's what these artists are doing with mid journey and these things. They're, they're not just clicking a button and generating a piece of art and going and selling it. They are doing very complicated prompts and coming up with some of the most fantastic imagery I've ever seen. Right. So that's where I'm coming from. It's, and I understand it's a gray line and I understand it's a weird line that we're having to draw here and that we're trying to discuss. But when you're using a digital tool, whether it's AR or not, it's still not just doing it for you. Well, and, and I get that. But if that's the case, then what's the harm in disclosing it? Well, there's not. There's not any harm in disclosing. You know, I agree with you on that part. Say artist John Doe, mid journey original artwork. Boom. Yeah. You've and, attributed and, it. And I agree. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what I'm trying to say is you don't make artists in other digital art fields do the same thing. They're not using AI. They, yes, they are. They're using, they're, they're using a form of it. They're using say Adobe Illustrator well, or whatever. AI as in Adobe Illustrator is different than no, no, AI. No, 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 no. I, I know, but I want to say is there, there are smart tools in Adobe Illustrator. Right. I can do a bunch of drawings and then well, I can ask AI to apply something to it and do all kinds. Of, but I don't disclose when I'm done that I did my artwork with Adobe Illustrator. Well, artists don't also disclose if they happen to use a ruler or a compass to draw a circle. Well, that's correct. Those are smart tools, depending on who you're asking. But that's what I'm saying. So that's what I'm saying. But you're asking at this point, you're asking an artist to disclose a tool that they're using. We're not disclosing another person. This isn't a person. This is AI. It's not, I mean, it's, it says artificial intelligence, but it's not really intelligent, right? It's not a person. It's a tool. But it got everything it has from other images that have been put on the internet by people. Okay. Yeah. We, and we're, so I'm about to have another discussion here, a little segue. 
my wife and I talked about this earlier. Yes, we're agreeing right. to disagree. We're agreeing to disagree on some of this stuff. Yes. But, but it's still fun to talk about because... It is. Because here's the thing, right? An artist gets their inspiration from somewhere. They do. Right? Uh, a landscape artist goes out into the world and sees landscapes and paints them. They right? do. But at the same time, you put me out there and have me paint the landscape and you bring back Claude Monet from the dead and have him create a landscape from the exact same vantage point, And I guarantee you it's going to be different based on the interpretation. I know that. And that, but I'm not saying that I am trying to use AI to create a Monet painting. And pass right. it off as a Monet painting. But there are lots of artists out there who will go paint that landscape and do it in a style, right? Uh, Monet's style or a Picasso style or whatever, right? That doesn't make them Picasso. No. That just makes what they did that style. These AIs are doing the same thing. They've been fed all this imagery. And now there have been artists that are arguing this exact point. They're like, wait a minute. If my art was fed into this thing for it to learn how to draw, then how come I'm not getting a cut of the money it makes? Mm -hmm. Exactly. But here's the thing. I know nothing about art, right? I walk into a museum. I look at all the lovely paintings on the wall. I, I, I leave the museum and I am inspired to go create my own painting. And I do. I happen, someone likes that painting and buys it for a hundred bucks. Am I also now liable? to share that $100 with every painting in that museum because they helped inspire me to do it. Inspiration is different than copying something. But so far, as far as I've so, like right now, all right, we are looking at what I asked mid-journey. I asked it to draw a Australian shepherd on a fallen log in a forest, right? Yes. So what part of that painting was stolen from another painting? You can't say, but at the same time... Who's to say it's not going to spit out a similar image for somebody else? How do you know that for sure? Because it doesn't. It's been proven. You can act, everything you generate with this thing is publicly viewable and available, mm -hmm. right? You can go to Mid Journey's website, Dolly's website. There is a public feed of everything this thing has generated. Well, if it's public, then how can you take ownership of it? Doesn't it belong to the AI? They have a thing specified in their terms and conditions that says if you generate a piece of work with this AI, it is yours to do with as you please. Okay. But does it have anything prohibiting somebody else that sees it from taking it and using it? That I do not know. So but that's again, just a question. I mean, I know some people go out and, you know, grab Google images or whatever there's probably tons of copyright violations out there that oh, yeah. big corporations. No doubt. I mean, I think, I think about Disney, they don't go after the mom and pop shops that are doing the Mickey mouse ears on shirts. They just don't have the time to do that. They go after the major counterfeiters yeah. and things like that in a situation like this. I mean, who knows? But I would imagine that. So if someone were to take this dog pic that I drew and use it on their website to make money, that I, as far as I can read from the terms and conditions, am allowed to go sue that person because that is my artwork. Because I generated it with my prompts and my asking for variations and asking to refine it from my work into the system. Yes. And see, I can understand you having ownership of it. At the same time, it not being something that you created with your own hand. You, yes, you created it with the that, AI. That right there is, is right there is the quintessential topic that we might as well say that we're trying to say is Brandy is saying that it needs to be marked whether it was done by your hand or if it was done by an AI. That's all you're saying. I do. That's exactly um, what I, what I think about it. Just, I feel like. People should disclose it because, I mean, if you're not embarrassed about using it, then why not disclose it? Because it, it feels to me like if someone is not disclosing it, that they're hiding it and they're not saying, oh, look at this amazing thing I created. I'm not doubting that these things are amazing. These images are different than anything I've ever seen. And I can appreciate them as being art. But I, I just, I feel differently about art that's actually created 
by a person with their hand, even if they're using a digital tool such as Adobe Illustrator or God forbid Canva, um, <laughs> something. Canva gets a lot of use around. Well, it does. It does. And if you're, you know, if you need to use Canva, great, use Canva. But um, me personally, it's I'm not a fan, but um, I just don't understand. That's the fuzzy line that's going to move, right? And as we get more information, as we become more used to the tools, that line is going to move on what people are allowed to say is theirs or not theirs. And I think it's also going to come down to these AI tools being told by an artist, you're not allowed to use my stuff. Now, that's one thing I do agree on right there, right? Right now, these guys are feeding, just feeding the internet basically into something, right? Yes. So if as an artist, I own a piece of artwork and I don't want it fed into these AI engines, I should be allowed to say, I don't want my stuff in your engine. Yes. And they how, should have a web. How would that work? I mean, is there a piece of code you put in it? No, what I would think is they, if, if they would have a website where I could submit my work and then they could subtract it out of their data set. That makes sense. Um, I can imagine though, that would be quite the undertaking of all the people who would not want, want their things fed through it. I mean, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm or a writer. Like said, it's very easy. And I wouldn't want my stuff put in there. So it should be very easy also that if you put it on the web, there'll be a tag or a phrase. Because right now, so I do some website design. So if I do not want a robot, like a search engine, to browse a page, I want it omitted, right? Because it doesn't have content on it. It's just, it's a page for someone to enter their email for a newsletter, right? You don't necessarily want a bot to crawl that and put it on the, on the web. There's an actual line of code that you can put into the website that says, do not crawl this page. Yes. Right? So maybe there should be something like that, that you need to be aware of. If you, if you post your work online, you are putting it out there for the world to see it. Yes. Right? And I think most people are aware of that. But, but you ought to have the option of saying, if I don't want this to be used, Tag it that way. I'm okay with that. Yes. Well, if, if it's like they <laughs> too late, it's already happened. So now it's going back. It's it's like the do not call list, yeah. which doesn't work, by the way. Um, it's a very this is this is I'm telling you, the next two or three years is going to be a very interesting time on the internet with all this with all this AI stuff that's coming out now. Just like Brandy said, I am disclosing right now that the cover art. <laughs> For today's episode was purposely generated with Mid Journey. Yes. <laughs> so that I could uh, give an example of what this stuff can do and you guys could see it right off the bat. Exactly. Uh, but I am disclosing it that I use Mid Journey. I think he's uh, doing that mainly to make me happy, but. Uh, well, mainly. Mainly. Uh, but mainly. But, you happy know. Happy wife, happy life. You betcha. But, you know, so uh, when you guys look at the cover art for today's episode, basically what I asked Mid Journey was is my wife here is a wonderful graphics artist. She actually made my logo for Binary Atlas many years ago, back when it was more of a gaming uh, company. And now I kind of moved into YouTube and podcasting, but uh, she made a globe and it had some binary uh, digits, you know, ones and zeros behind it. She made several variations. Some is the lettering, some is just the globe, all kinds of different things she did for me. So basically I kind of asked the AI to do something similar. I said, I would like a, I would like the globe on a flat surface with a white background, I would like binary code ones and zeros to be behind the earth. And then it generated four different results. My daughter was up here at the time, Meredith, and I asked her which one she liked best. She says, I like that one. So I generated four variations on that one and did a couple more until I got the one that I like that you'll see on, you'll see on the podcast. Uh, but that's just, a, just an example of uh, some of the things you can do. And of course you can't, you guys can't really, because this is not a video podcast, but you know, there's, I generated an old man. Well, it's funny though, is I didn't ask for an old man. I asked for uh, a steampunk man in his forties working on a glowing engine. 
Okay. Thinking that it, thinking that it might generate something akin to my age because I'm in my 40s, but that's not a guy in his 40s uh, to me. Well, maybe they thought 1940s. I don't know. Ma uh, you know what? That, they might have. Maybe, might. The style of dress looks a little bit more like 1940s, but the the men in the photo look like they are closer to a 70 to 80 year old uh, in range. So who knows? <laughs> Yeah, and then I had one where I the simple prompt was a man sitting on a hill reading a book with lightning in the sky and a portal opening up and got this weird <laughs> this weird thing with it opening up and all kinds of portals and stuff like that. Uh, most of this has been mid-journey. Uh, another really weird response I got from a uh, one of the AIs. So I play Fortnite. It's a video game. And there's this new heat system where as you kill other players and do things, you generate heat levels. And the higher your heat level, the more notorious you are and you can be seen by other players and stuff like that. So I asked Fortnite, I says, Fortnite has a new heat system where players with full heat show up on the mini map. Can you find me an, a screenshot of what that looks like? What I was expecting was that I figured someone out on the Internet would have taken a screenshot of what that looks like, right? A screenshot of the game. That's not what I got. What I got was, sure, I can help you with that. Fortnite has a new heat system where players with full heat show up on the minimap as red dots. The heat level increases as you eliminate opponents, deal damage, or complete quest. Here's a screenshot of what it looks like. Now, I, I, this is just hilarious. So what actually, it's not a screenshot. The AI actually drew a picture with slashes and dots, almost like you're texting on an old style phone. <laughs> and it's got a stick man with a dot below it. <laughs> and I looked, I went to every single website that it says it got information from and that picture shows up nowhere. <laughs> it is the funniest looking thing. We may have to share that in some show notes. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. I, I need to. I need to put in some show notes and stuff and share some of this stuff. Some of this stuff just looks ridiculous. Yes, I will make him follow up on that, some show notes, and we'll share a photo of our podcast mascot here, Roscoe, who uh, thought we were so fascinating that he fell asleep. So. <laughs> So I think that about wraps it up for us today. Yes. Uh, we just kind of wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive into some, some of this AI stuff that's going on. Remember, uh, go to our website, binaryatlas.com, where I have some articles posted. I have some uh, merch and things like that. Also, the YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash at binary atlas, that will take you to the YouTube channel. And as always, we appreciate any comments, likes, and follows you guys can do on this podcast, wherever you end up listening to this podcast at. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and we will see you next week. Thank you.